Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I'm sitting down with a guy that wears many hats. He's a stand-up comedian, a voice actor, an animation historian, and he just happens to be the guy that has written my favorite book with an animation, The Moose That Roared, the story of Jay Ward, Bill Scott, a flying squirrel, and a talking moose, Mr. Keith Scott. If you want to help support this podcast, you should sign up for our Patreon. That link will be in the show notes. If you want to throw a few shekels our way, just know it all goes back into the show and helps us get better each week. Now, let's get on to my chat with the great Keith Scott. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's in My Head podcast. I'm your host, Julian. Today, I'm joined by Keith. Keith, welcome to the show, man. Hi, Julian. How are you? Great to be here. And uh, great to... Uh, I've seen a couple of your podcasts, and I like it. I like it a lot. I love the one with Jerry Beck. Oh, man. Jerry Beck was such a fun guy. And I, I'm, right. thank you for the compliment, for one. For But first off, ladies and gentlemen, if you have not yet, I've talked about this book so many times, so many times throughout so many episodes in the almost three years. Next week, a week after next, we'll be doing the show for three years. And wow. I've brought up your book on multiple occasions. The Moose That Roared, ladies and gentlemen, the definitive uh, history. Yes, history of Jay Ward Productions. So, like I said, thank you. Before we hit that, thank you for so much for that book. And I would love to know, why does this book come to you why do you have to write this book this one felt like you had to have this one done out there for the masses to read why was this one so special to you yeah i, I guess so uh, if i think back uh when i was like uh six going on seven i was one of these people who was fatally drawn to um, tv cartoons in a way that uh, anyone who does voices for a living like professionally um and and I'm talking cartoony voices, imitations and crazy characters. Um, you you usually hit at that age. I've spoken with people like Billy West and other people, and, and all of them have the same backstory as me. It was seeing either Hanna-Barbera or Jay Ward Productions cartoons at that age when TV was just three channels. There was nothing like there is today, of course. And uh, I it took me, um, with the Jay Ward stuff, Rocky and His Friends, I think, was the first series that they did and um, it just struck something in me that uh, was like it it it, it uh, created that Sherlock Holmes mania for the rest of my life and uh, and so as I grew older in high school I started writing to these people who I saw in the credits and uh, I wrote to Doss Butler first of all because I'd <laughs> seen him on pictures on of him on the Stan Freeberg double album about Stan Freeberg's radio shows from 57 and he looked human and looked approachable so i wrote to him and he couldn't have, he ended up uh, as as his uh, reputation is with everyone as the nicest person ever in the history of the business and he he sent me uh, like a seven page letter i expected like an autograph or something and uh, and photos and things that i hadn't even asked for and gave me advice about uh, I was only 17, I think, and he gave me advice about how to do accents and things like that. And it was like lessons from the master I hadn't even asked for. And that, and then he sent me also, um, when I told him I didn't know who Bill Scott did the voices of, he told me it was Bullwinkle and Dudley Do-Right and all of this because he'd only taken a producer credit. Mm -hmm. um, he wasn't listed in the uh, list of voice actors. And of course, he was the main one. And so he gave me his address and June Foray's address. And that started my mania where... These people, strangely enough, I always say, my mother used to say when I was a kid, these people will be too busy to answer you, you know, <laughs> yeah. but they couldn't have been nicer. And I think um, there must have been something in my letter that wasn't like a normal fan letter. There, there must have been a degree of knowledge or something. I can't remember. But uh, they took me seriously. And uh, and eventually June Foray was responsible, believe it or not, for getting me to work in, in um, American uh, movies, uh, doing voices. Uh, that that story will come in a few minutes, but that's how it, really how it started. And when I met Bill Scott, I won a trip to Hollywood in 1973, just as I was getting my feet wet in the business. And I have to precede this by saying, again, it's like fate was looking down on me favorably. Um, in '72, I had a just graduated high school and had an office job, you know, making my mind up as to whether to do a course in in law at university. And uh, really, I had been bitten by this showbiz bug. Uh, of course, at that age, people like me had no idea how to get into it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
but uh, I met a girl at this office job and she said uh, she knew somebody in Hanna-Barbera. I thought she was talking about in Hollywood, you know. And um, it turns out they had just opened a branch in Sydney like two months before. And she said, and there's this white haired guy, Hannah, I think running it. And I, I my, uh, my head did another explosion. So I, I, um, I calmed down and my, my um, folks told me to, you know, approach it methodically. And I took my letters from Dawes Butler, his chief voice, you know, Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear, and all of that with me. And Bill Hannah, um, just immediately grasped it because he said when I he said when I was your age uh, and I was 18 uh, he said he got a job at the harmonizing cartoon studio in Hollywood in 1930 where they did the first ever Looney Tunes and uh, he said he was he he recognized in me the same enthusiasm that Doris Butler had recognized so he said do you want to do voices and I said yeah but I haven't got an agent or anything he said well how about I give you a job around the office and you can learn about the whole cartoon industry so I did, you know, I jumped at that and um, it was seasonal. I, I think I, I lasted about nine months and then there was a layoff. But he gave me a reference on paper, like a to whom it may concern, and um, and praised my, my pretty um, uh, amateurish uh, voice demo from back in 1972 and put his signature at the bottom, William Hanna, this world famous cartoon executive, and that got me an agent straight away. So... That was fate looking down on me. And then six months later, it looked down on me again because there was a contest in the local TV Guide magazine, which was a winner trip to Hollywood in 25 words or less. And I mentioned about doing all these voices. And I think they, they thought my entry was so un unusual that, that they let me win it. <laughs> it was three weeks in Hollywood and uh, I got to meet all these people that knew about me via letters, old fashioned snail mail, you know. So I met Jay Ward and I met Bill Scott and went to lunch with all of them and they were taking me far more seriously. And that's when Bill Scott said to me in 1973, um, I gave him some lists of some of the cartoons. He said, this is more comprehensive than some of the records we've got back at the office across the street. He said, he said, I predict one day you'll write a book about us. And of course, I, you know, I didn't have a clue what he was talking about, but boy, did it come true. <laughs> you know, the only, the only disappointing thing to me is that, uh, by the time it was published, Bill Scott had been gone for 14 years, so he didn't get to yeah. see it. Uh, he died very suddenly. I think he was only just 65 when he when mm -hmm. he passed away. That, of course, that's way too young by today's standards. Uh, but boy, what he had accomplished in really setting up that whole thing about uh, that you people like yourself recognize is that, that those Jay Ward cartoons, in my opinion, really were the top ones of that era only because you look back now and they were like 30 years ahead of their time in being like the Simpsons of their day. You know, they mm -hmm. were, so, they worked, I, I can always remember saying to people that uh, I, I loved it as a kid would love it, but I got frustrated if my, my um, parents were in the room and they laughed at some joke that I knew <laughs> I didn't, I knew I'd get in, in like 10 years, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was another source of fascination. And then around about that same time, I also got interested in uh, this this burgeoning nostalgia market of these big LP records of old time radio shows. And I made the connection that William Conrad, the voice of the narrator of Rocky and Bullwinkle is appearing in all these old radio. So I became a fanatic collector of all these shows to hear all. Really, I started out um, collecting them just to get the voices of the cartoon people. But then I, of course, I became a full time collector because I recognized the the uh, quality of uh, of good old time radio. I mean, like like every media, like films, like everything, there was a lot of dross as well as the good stuff. But boy, the good stuff with Orson Welles and classic people like that was great, you know. Um, so again, I became um, a cartoon buff, an old an old movie buff from the classic era, and an old time radio buff, all in this same period. And it's become this, like, like I guess I created my own monster. You know, it's been, <laughs> here it is 40 years later and I'm still as fanatically interested in all of it as I, as I ever was. Dude, you've lived so many lives in the one life you have, man. Uh, it is. It's, it's bizarre, you know, and I, I, I keep thinking, um, boy, am I lucky because I, I look back and I, I think at the time I didn't realize how blessed I was, Bill Hanna, Doris Butler, uh, Paul Fries, all these top names in, in the business. I got to know them intimately, personally, you know, uh, as as uh, as a fan and then as a kind of like they became my mentors, you know. 
I, I, I remember Paul Free's agent called me up in when I was in Hollywood saying, now he's going to be down at Radio Recorders, which is one of the oldest studios in Hollywood at the time. And he said, uh, he's doing a Jolly Green Giant commercial if you want to go and meet him in person. And of course, I, I raced down there on foot, not knowing how far the distances were in Hollywood. <laughs> But I got there and he recognized me because he knew I was the guy who had just written to him. And, and with Paul Fries, uh, who was the voice of Boris Badenoff, for your, for your uh, interested listeners, um, he, he was regarded as somebody who was a bit standoffish. But with me, he couldn't have been nicer again. And um, so I saw him at this session and he recognized I was the guy. He had just had, I think, one of the world's first ever home studios built in his house in 72. And he sent me a reel-to-reel, a, a tape uh, to my letter, you know. And, and here, here is that great voice, the narrator of Dudley Do-Right cartoons, saying, To my good friend Keith Scott, all the way down in Australia, who told you I wouldn't reply, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I was getting this, um, this uh, blessed thing that I look back now and think, you know, I didn't realize how lucky I was, but it really what it did was Bill Hanna got me started working in Australia in the voiceover industry. At the same time, I was also enamored of all of the old um, stand-up impressionists on the Ed Sullivan show, you know, the, the people like Frank Gorshin yeah, and uh, Rich Little and Will Jordan, all these people, mainly because, again, like cartoon voices, seeing impressionists when I was a young kid made me think that's another aspect of using the human voice to uh, achieve a comedy result or a, or a, like a cartoon character, except you're, you're entertaining a live audience. So once my career took off in the um, mid-70s, I began a pattern for the next 35 years of doing voiceovers during the week, Monday to Friday, and then on weekends I'd be working in clubs on a stage in front of an audience doing all these impressions. So it was like a Jekyll Hyde existence, but... <laughs> It, it it did trigger uh, this this historic interest that I've got, and that that is really why the book tends to be. Uh... In fact, the funny thing is, even though you praise the book, and I'm so appreciative of that, there there was a degree of um, an understandable criticism when it came out. A lot of the people said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, this is, this is really," but it's it's too much info. <laughs> no such thing. No such yeah, well. thing. When it comes to history, I want to know it all. That's why I do this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you 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 said something that that I don't I don't think I don't think I've heard it because whenever I have people come on, ladies and I'm, I'm I'm so sorry. You have to hear this again. Whenever you guys come on, I, I try to go and watch any interview you guys have done, listen to anything you've done. That way I have a basic understanding of, you know, I'm not going to ask him that because he's been asked that 14 times the last three sure. interviews yeah. I've watched. You know what I mean? Plus, it's right. just stale. It's no fun. You know, you guys want to have fun when you come on and I want to have fun, too. Um, sure. But the fact that you wrote letters, which you said in your book, you know, that's how you that's how you came to Hollywood. That's, and yeah. what is so fascinating about that, and why I bring it up is that's kind of how this podcast started. I was just mm -hmm. happening. It was during COVID. I just happened to watch one of my, not one of my favorite movie of all time, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from the 1990s with the Jim Henson <laughs> production <laughs> suits, right? The live guys in the suits. Right. I'm watching this movie and I just happen to look up and I see a name that I've, I've watched this movie thousands of times, right? When I was a kid, I right. burnt this DVD or not DVD, excuse me. I burnt this VHS out on multiple VHS, occasions. Yes. Yep. So I just happened to look up when I was cooking or cleaning and I see a name of nurse, you know, like, man, I wonder. So I just Google it. Finds out he's 45 minutes down the street from me. He passed away wow. a couple years prior, the year prior. Um, and mm. then they had written up an article about him. So I was reading the article and I was like, I want to know more about this guy. Why don't I, why haven't I never heard this name before? And at the right. bottom of that, the guy that wrote it in the, uh, the article in the newspaper had his phone number in there. So I just, out of, you know, just I, let's, let's try it. Like, let's call, let's mm. see what happens. He picks sure. up or no, excuse me. Okay. It doesn't pick up. I leave him a voicemail and he calls me back. Sorry. Sorry. And uh, we talk, and I was like, man, this is a really cool story. I'm a huge turtle fan. Come to find out the guy that wrote the article didn't really like the turtles. His young sons love the Ninja Turtles like everybody my age. Yeah, um, right. And he was like, here's the number to his manager. Give him a call and see what happens. That mm -hmm. led to me wanting to do a podcast about Ninja Turtles. Stuff fell through like life kind of happens. Life throws a monkey wrench in your plans, and then you got to sure, adjust yeah. and you know re-engage, right? So right. that's how I started doing animation. But it was just that natural curiosity of yeah. wanting to yeah. know 
who that person was on the credits and why they had such a huge part that's in my, my childhood. Exactly like me. That's you. Yeah, yeah. you, you had that same bug uh, bugging you. Yeah, I know mm -hmm. exactly what you mean. Um, did you eventually uh, contact anyone uh, over the years about your interest in Ninja Turtles? Because uh, the, oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel yeah. A, lot, a lot of them are still around and still love talking about that experience. I mean, like that—that uh, that they do. Yeah. Um, I, I think from memory when it was a big thing and it was around 89, 90, um, I was, did a couple of commercials where obviously back in those days, not only was ISDN expensive, you know, there was no zoom, but, uh, it would have been prohibitive for them to hire the original actors. So I can't do it anymore. It's been so long, but for, I did for about a year, I did some of the turtles voices in animated commercials yeah. here, <laughs> just cashing in on the fact that it was a huge franchise. It was, oh, I, I do cool. remember I, I kind of mastered Cowabunga, man, you know, <laughs> that, that Californian <laughs> sort of dialect. <laughs> That's so cool. I've, I actually had uh, I had a couple of them on. My first episode was with Rob Paulson. I'm pretty sure you. It's yeah. the name I was thinking of. Yep. That's yeah, right. Rob, Rob Paulson. Um, I've had two of the original four. Um, they were just right. at the Orlando uh, Comic Con here a couple weeks ago, oh, and so was Kevin right. Eastman. I've had I've had a right. few of them on from different iterations, from comic books to cartoons. Um, right. I mean, I'll, I'll send you some pictures after we get off this call. Like yeah, I've sure. got the turtles sitting above me. I've got them tattooed on my <laughs> arm. I mean. It's it was I mean, I drew, I drew them back on the wall back there, you know, so it's it's just this fascination of these things. It's just like it came into my life when I was really, really yeah. young and it never really left me. And now that I have yeah. kids um, and mm -hmm. with that new Ninja Turtle movie that just came out uh, yes, a couple right. months back, yeah. I was sitting there and getting to see the same exact thing my mom saw when she saw the Ninja Turtle bug bite me. I'm sitting there right. and we're in the movie theater and my two year old son, Cooper, he's sitting there with me. And usually I wait until they're like five, six years old before I take them to the movie theater because most of the time they don't want to watch a movie. They want to get up and play. But him, sure. he was so excited because the turtles. He just wow. found out who the turtles were like six months ago, right? Or six months wow. prior. And he's sitting there. He sees the trailer, right, when we're in a different movie theater. He's like tr jumping out of his seat, naming every single turtle. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, they're going to kick us out. And everybody yeah. that was in the theater was just looking back and smiling at him like, who else? Who else? They were trying to get names out of him. I'm like, all right, well, this is cool. Then the movie comes out and I'm sitting there and I'm watching him watch the movie. And it was the wildest thing because I, like I said, I got to see what my mom saw yeah. in me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I found the turtles, you know, it was just such yeah. a cool and surreal experience. It becomes and speaking intergenerational. Of, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh man, does it, it passes down mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, the family jewels or any kind of, you know, family <laughs> heirloom type of thing. But, uh, speaking of that moment, that surreal moment when mm -hmm. I want to circle back to, to what you were saying, when you're on that plane ride, when did it feel real, I guess, is what I'm getting at. When you win that contest to go to Hollywood and meet all of right. these folks, at what point does it does it feel real? Does it still feel fake? I mean, what what when did it happen? I, it was I was uh, I can vaguely uh, conjure up the uh, emotions that it felt like back in 1973 because uh, um, I had let some of them know that I'd won this mm -hmm. contest uh, after uh, I think a five week lag before we flew. And so they were expecting me. And, and so I didn't really feel too much trepidation because by then uh, I'd had a couple of letters from most of them, especially Bill Scott. And, um, and, uh, and so I'd also, June Foray had put me onto a, a, another voice actor there in Hollywood who was more my generation called Corey Burton. Um, when he was still in high school, he had also become like me, unbeknownst to me, he'd become another Jay Ward fanatic. Uh, mm -hmm. about voices and so um, I was about a year and a half older than him and uh, she made us into uh, what used to be called pen friends you know in the old yeah. day, uh, male pen days pals. yeah now now it'd be like you know going back and forth on Facebook every day but, uh, <laughs> but we, we, back then it was these very studious late teenage letters about all of the history of Jay Ward productions that we knew up till then and our, our opinions on all sorts of things and we became friends and um and so when my, my parents accompanied me, because it was a trip for two, you know, and so my, both my parents came with me to Hollywood just to see it. But they were like tourists. They were off doing their own thing. And every morning I uh, caught a bus from the um, Holiday Inn in Hollywood down to Jay Ward Productions. And um, the best person I met there was a guy called Skip Craig, who's in the credits as the editor. And you'll see him quoted many times throughout the book, the history, um, because he was also... Um, 
one of the leading collectors of old time radio and and again like us he had a childhood fascination uh he loved the um spike jones and the city slickers the crazy mm. musicians you know the Fuhrer's face and all of those great and um as a young guy he he ended up being such a super fan of them that he was traveling with them around their gigs and that all over america back in like 1950 and so again when i walked into here because the, jay ward's wife told me oh you should go to the little studio back here this is our, our main office you'll meet skip craig he's the guy who does all these old radio cassettes and things that we sell here at the dudley do right shop so again like bill scott and doris butler they recognized in me and and same as rob paulson would have recognized in you that the passion was there and uh, yeah. and immediately took to me and he became one of the most helpful people i've ever met in hollywood he he would mention me to jay ward and all of these people and oh you got to use this guy you know one day he's going to take over these voices <laughs> because i i think i can do them much better now than i did them then but he must have recognized that i had the spark there you know because i I'm, i know probably embarrassingly i walked around his office um and he said, well, do some for me. And so, hey, Rocky, watch me blow my out of my head. Nothing up the sleeve. Presto. You know, and doing all this and probably being a little obnoxious as a late teen. But <laughs> but it worked. It worked for me. <laughs> Who was easier to slip in back then? And you know, obviously, you've been doing it for so long now. It's probably just second right. nature. But back then, yes. who was easier to slip into, Rocky or Bullwinkle? Oh, well, I never did Rocky because that was June Foray, a female voice. Um, well, yeah, uh, but I got to figure you tried it, though. Did you Did you ever oh, try sure. it? Did you ever I get probably, close? I probably tried to say, uh, that old trick, you know, it's like a falsetto <laughs> thing. But uh, <laughs> no, I think um, in those days, I, I, I'd i say Bullwinkle probably was the easiest. So many people can do a Bullwinkle because it is. But Bill Scott told me, you know, he, he said a lot of people, a lot of people do them like this, like a dumb guy. He said, he said, and he's the guy who invented the voice. He said, no, he said, no. He said, Bullwinkle was a smart goof. He said, that's the way I look at him. So he talks very quickly like an intelligent person does, except he's got that voice. Uh, and the other one that I used to do um, was his other star character was Dudley Do-Right of the Mounties. And that one took a, a little longer because it was a tight voice. You know, it's like, Dudley Do-Right of the Mounties. Snidely whiplash. <laughs> How dare you foreclose mortgages? <laughs> So, I, it, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying that all of these voices became a passion for me. All the old Hanna Barbera ones, like, Yogi Bear, Mr. Ranger, sir. <laughs> you know. So, each each of the people who I knew who originated those voices, even Dawes Butler said to me, "Oh, you've you've got old Yogi." He said, "You'll you'll be doing that one when I'm gone." You know, they said it jokingly and, and affectionately, but uh, boy, it came true. <laughs> it, it's. It, it's so wild because it's I've said it so many times on this podcast it there's nothing like a voice from a cartoon that you've heard as right. a kid uh, yeah. a smell of your favorite food that your mom would make yep. you when you were growing up you know there's these sensory overloads that we have yeah. that that can instantly transport us back 20 30 oh, yeah. 40 50 what, years what did what did T.S. Eliot the famous old writer call he said he called that that phenomenon an objective correlative <laughs> <laughs> like a favorite smell that takes you back or a, or a, the smell of a book or something you know <laughs> it, it's it's just wild because you know rocky and bullwinkle much like yourself came into my life very young too right mm -hmm. i remember yeah. the first time i ever saw rocky and bullwinkle i've always been a, a, a person that just does not sleep much i maybe get three four hours of sleep a night i just right i have yeah. a hard time turning my brain off it's just like i think yeah. about everything I that i'm gonna do the next day you know what i mean oh, and yeah. I would channel surf at night and channel surf means I would jump from 34, 35 and 36. The 34 was Nickelodeon, 35 was Disney and 30, uh, 36 was Cartoon Network. And right, most of the right. time, the the Rocky and Bullwinkle shows were playing on late night Cartoon Network. So 12, yes. 30, one o'clock, yes. you know, I would turn it on and Jay Ward Productions would be showing Rocky and Bullwinkle. And I just remember looking that I love Peabody and Sherman. That was my favorite. Yes. I'm a huge history fan. I love oh, history. Yeah. And yeah. just seeing that was just so interesting. And then I went from watching cartoons like Bugs Bunny and Tom and Jerry earlier in the day to seeing mm. this different style of animation, yeah. these different oh, voices, yeah. these just different characters. And I'm like, this is some of the most interesting shit I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And I'm sitting here watching this. I'm like, why doesn't all the kids know about this? Like my grandparents yeah. knew about it because my mom watched yeah. it as a kid. You know what I mean? Right. Or my mom would see it and shit. 
you know, so it, it, like yeah. I'm sitting here watching this and it's like I said, such a fascination. And then it mm. wasn't until a little bit later when I can buy or see the, the you know, on streaming sites or buy the DVDs or find them on reruns. That's and I right. really start watching and then I read your book and I'm like, oh, my God, I forgot about how much I loved staying up late yeah. and watching this yes. show, you know. <laughs> It was such a fascinating, uh-huh. fascinating studio. And one of the stories I, I went back and reread a couple times in your book was the fact that Jay Ward almost wasn't Jay Ward. You know, that whole thing mm. where he got hit by a, what yeah. was it a van or a, or a, or a car, a truck? Well, it was a, you know? yeah, a very large truck went out of control on a steep hill. Yeah. Yeah. D- it's wild and, uh, to think almost that, that would have went a little. Yeah, well, well if he would have died, you know, we don't get that. We don't get George the Jungle. We don't get the yeah. Captain Crunch guy. You we know don't what I mean? Get all of those things. Yeah, it's wild yeah. when you think about it. Just something that's so small that yeah. could have happened and completely changed the, oh, yes. the 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 course of history. Yes, we would have had Hanna Barbera, for instance. But no, see that I always, I don't, I couldn't put it into words when I was a kid. But uh, it there was something more indefinable about the Jay Ward. Uh, things whether it was based on his earlier one crusader rabbit which didn't have the spark of his later stuff but it set the template for all of that thing about a narrator and a serial mm-hmm. that was continued chapter by chapter which really according to bill scott was just you know we were just extending the old radio tune in next time and you know keep yeah. you in suspense sort of thing but um uh you know it's so funny that uh, there is now a new generation, even younger than yourself, who are discovering these cartoons now that you've got these Facebook pages. And as dated as some of the references are, you know, the stuff still works. That's yes. the weird thing. And I, I remember just seeing recently a clip of some old Bullwinkle cartoon that uh, it's almost like uh, in the era of Trump and Biden, um, it, it was a, a just one of those little throwaway gags they did in one of the Rocky episodes where it cut to a politician who was who had obviously been affected by goof gas, and um, and the joke just works like to, it sounds like it was written today by a, mm-hmm. by a really good comedian, uh, like it was written in 1962, and this this old s- senator gets up in in Congress and says. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I propose a bill uh, that we set aside $35 billion to find out why the government spends so much money. <laughs> and that's in a kid's cartoon. You know, <laughs> no wonder no wonder all the adults were laughing at it. I, I, I remember once um, seeing in the 1960s, uh, I, I was in the city of Sydney for when I used to go to an orthodontist and I must have only been in my teens, but I, I saw a newspaper um, reference to Bullwinkle at a news, newsstand and it was an, from an American column and the guy was saying, you know, television in the, in the 1960s is pretty ordinary. Uh, he said, apart from Walter Cronkite and Bullwinkle, I don't even have my set on. <laughs> So even back then, it was like recognized as something oddball and special. Did uh, there's something I wanted to ask you? Um, mm. Was Crusader Rabbit done before the accident with Jay Ward? No, no, it was done after, as he was recovering. Mm. Oh, you've got me now. Yes, it was. It was done because it was. He had the accident on the opening day of his real estate business. And uh, as he was recuperating, his friend Alex Anderson, who, with whom he went to high school, he, he was the animator. Alex Anderson came and visited him in the hospital and told him about his idea for a limited animation TV thing. And Jay Ward had always loved um, showbiz and performance, even though he, he wasn't a performer himself. Uh, and he had a business degree and he wanted to do something to do with showbiz at some point in his life. Um, and so he, he as as alex anderson said i mentioned this this concept of a cartoon series to him and he came out of the water like a trout he said i i didn't ex- i thought maybe he'd say no nah, i'm not interested but uh, no it uh, so yeah yeah that's uh, but it was ve- it was basically like one year after his near fatal accident uh, they had um, crusader rabbit in production it's so, it's a uh, fascinating yeah. thing cuz uh, mm-hmm. there's there's a couple stories that i've heard over the last few years um, about head trauma, right? So mm-hmm. obviously, if you're getting hit by a, har- a car or truck, you're going to get your noodle rattled quite a bit. Oh yeah. And yeah. there's two comedians in particular that I've heard the story from that completely changed 
the, them as a person after they had a car accident. Mm -hmm. Roseanne right. Barr, when she was uh, a kid, yeah. she was struck by a car and she was put into an oh. insane asylum for like six, seven months. She forgot how to count. She was a straight A student, a math whiz before she was she was hit with a car and then she that. just Ooh. yeah yeah she she said it on the uh joe rogan podcast she had talked about it uh, right. and then there was another guy i don't know if you um you ran around in the comic strip so you might ah uh, shit my brother sam i can't think of his name i can see his face um right big guy That's trench sam coat Kennison. sam kennison thank you i couldn't yeah, think of yeah. his last name I same concept he was a, he's, he, um, a marvelous comedian yeah. Oh man, he brilliant, yeah. brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Um, what he did on the yeah. Rodney Dangerfield specials. Yeah, you know, that, I, that I got thing to see about him being in the desert away. and feed the people in the desert, and that it was just he had me just rolling around with tears coming out of my eyes, and it was like outrageous the approach he took. And I'm sure he he would be cancelled within two minutes oh, in today's culture. Hundred, a hundred percent. But the same thing with him. He yeah. was a very shy, very quiet, yeah. very mild mannered kid. Yeah. Same concept. He gets hit by a car and smacks his head on the ground and completely wow. changes him. There's a book called My Brother Sam. Um, or brother uh -huh. Sam, excuse me, that his brother wrote about him after he passed away, and he talks about mm -hmm. that. And it's and it's one. I was wondering if 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 the Crusader Rabbit was done prior to the uh, to the accident, because I wonder if something like that just really did something to his head, where he's like, "Oh man, it completely changed his focus. It completely changed the trajectory of his life." I think I think it gave him a sense of fatalism. I know that because um, he was happy to try this uh, experiment in show business, even though he was basically a, an MBA from Harvard and, and that mm -hmm. was going to open a real estate business. Uh, I think the um, according to some of the people, if you read the Jay Ward chapter, uh, there are uh, childhood friends I've, I've got to. So I think nearly everyone I interviewed for that book is gone now because it was, it was written so like 23 years ago. But um uh, they all said uh, as a young guy, he loved comedy, he loved performing and uh, people who did performances and so on. He was a great admirer, like a producer. Um, a successful producers are often great appreciators of talent. Uh, they don't try and interfere, you know, and, and make notes for people. They, they appreciate them and, and then they surround those people with the, with the best talents to help the show. Well, that's how he, he operated. And I think, uh, as you say, the head trauma probably, um, determined him that uh, well if i don't do this now i think that somebody's sending me a message that you know i'm, I'm on another path like yeah. he i i have met people who said he was so smart you know having graduated harvard that he kept his real estate business running all through the jay ward productions years you know just in case it was like the old <laughs> thing about you gotta have something to fall back on <laughs> Go to college and get that degree just yeah, in case that, exactly. that that passing project doesn't work out. Now, yeah. with all of the folks that you got to to interact with and hang out with and talk with and really converse right. and, and grow, because like you said, you you know they started your career in the mm -hmm. uh, in, in that industry with those folks. Um, one name I, I keep wanna I keep wanna circle back to, and then we'll go to the others, man. But uh, Bill Hanna. He's come right, up quite right. a few, quite a few uh, times before throughout a couple of my chats because I've had a lot of folks on that have had some firsthand experience with them. But when right. you think of Bill, obviously he wrote you that that recommendation, that letter uh, yeah. that yeah. got you an agent and you know really opened some doors for you. With you mm -hmm. walking around that uh, that building for I think you said six or nine months, whatever it was, I uh, did. was it nine yeah. months? Yeah. yeah, about nine months. Yeah, about nine months. What? What was your favorite story that you did you get to talk to Bill very much? I mean, I got to imagine you you ran into him a few times. A few times, although he was very busy because uh, his whole thing was he wasn't he unlike Joe Barbera, he wasn't an artist. He mm -hmm. worked in in animation. Uh, he he was uh, one of these people who specialized in timing. So he worked with the exposure sheets in the old days of of cell animation, and uh, his sense of timing and um, and where to cut dialogue and where to uh, but he also had been trained as a musician as a kid so he uh he wrote a lot of the oddball um theme songs with uh hoyt curtain i think his name was and um you'd hear bill hannah's influence in things like that flintstones ep very early flintstones episode where it was uh the happy anniversary and they're all sitting around the piano going, happy anniversary happy you know and that's that's him as one of the singers in that that was a, a childhood thing with him he learned piano and uh, and he was very musical. He wrote a lot of lyrics in cartoons in the 1930s when they used to be much more musical. And so um, he told me a few things like that and told me, um, you know, when he first met Doris Butler and what he thought of Paul Fries and all of these people. 
um, whatever questions I knew enough about back then to ask him, and I'm talking 1972, God, my knowledge has increased so much. I'd, I, I, I'd want to ask him many more things now if he was still with us. But he, he again, he was a very nice, he had a really measured way of talking. You know, he'd always answer a question like, I believe that when I first saw Das Butler, you know, he'd talk like that. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, um, one of his animators, Tony Benedict, uh, got me to do an impression of Bill Hanna for a little <laughs> film he was going to make, an animated tribute to the days of Bill and Joe's. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so he was he was just a great guy, but very busy, you know, very busy. And uh, But then when I got to Hollywood, uh, after he'd returned, it was like 12 months later, and uh, Doris Butler called him up and said, hey, guess who's in town? That kid who, who was working around your office in Sydney, he, inv he called me up where I was staying at Corey Burton's house, and he invited us to a session of wait till your father gets home you know the the uh, cartoon with voiced by tom bosley from happy days and um so again this was like well i'm in a foreign land to me but here i am and all these big wigs are getting me to come and watch a session I, it's like uh, when is all this gonna stop <laughs> it was always that fear that you know i'm 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 getting too lucky you know <laughs> But I think, I think, as I said, it boils down to that fact. Those people that you admire recognize that you have this passion and knowledge about them. And it, it's actually, I look back now that I'm a senior age and I can see that it was flattering to them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think Bill Scott put it that way. He said, uh, he said uh, a, lot of, a lot of these guys, you know, they, they get a bit threatened by you at first because uh, uh, you hit them with all of this stuff that they'd forgotten about. And then when they go away and think about it, they say, my God! They start telling their friends this guy. He, <laughs> he was he was telling me things I'd forgotten. <laughs> now, so. when when you're over here for the first time, uh, I mean, well, right. that was your first time coming to America. Was that that trip you won for Hollywood? Yep, yep, in '73. Well, that's right. What do you remember about that first time touching down in America? Does anything stick out to you? Is like, holy shit, they do this over here? Probably uh, everything. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Uh, everything <laughs> in those days was on a much bigger scale because Australia was uh, a smaller population than it is now. And so, but because I'd spent my whole life watching old black and white films from the 30s up through the 50s and 60s, I kind of knew a lot about Americana and also having been a, a mad magazine person for all mm -hmm. of my life uh, and stuff. So I, I, I felt a real affinity with the USA. I don't know why, but I just did. And, uh, and that has also not stopped. It's like uh, I often say when I go to, to um, the town of Hollywood, I can sort of smell the history of the town in the air, going yeah. back to the, you know, like the silent days. There was that great series called uh, Hollywood by Kevin Brownlow. Um, I, I get a sense of that. And I, I know a couple of other people, like the movie director David Lynch, he said the same thing. Like uh, he's such a fan of, of old Hollywood that he gets that sense of the whole history when he when he moved there he had to move there to live you know <laughs> but uh, because I had the um, quite early on I had a career that started to work for me in voiceovers in Sydney and I really started getting more and more work and I thought well I'm not going to nip this in the bud and move to Hollywood where there's much more competition you know um, so it just became a place that I visited once a year when I could afford to um, while those great heroes of mine were still with us. Mm -hmm. That began in 79. I'd had a few good years of starting to really build a name here in Sydney, and I could afford to go once a year on, I suppose they used to call them fact-finding missions uh, to Hollywood, and still see Doris Butler and Bill Scott and all of these greats, June Foray, for the next... 10 years before old age started catching up with them and they started dying off you know yeah so it, yeah yeah as you as you as you asked it really was uh, yeah. it was it was something i was already familiar with but it, it gave me that sense of excitement i'm actually in the in this land that's fascinated me all my life and and here here i'm i'm determined not to let this trip be a failure and well from day one uh everything started happening on that three-week trip. I, I went multiple times to Jay Ward's studio and things like that. So, you know, it was almost like you could you could say um, you were the one it was meant to happen to, you know, without <laughs> you were the chosen one. 
<laughs> yeah, you were the chosen yeah, one. Is that's what it right. Was yeah, yeah, I, if you want to get like that, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Now, there's a name that you I wanted to circle back to as well, because I, mm-hmm. I've heard so many great stories. I've had Billy West on here. I had him on my first year, probably like episode right. 10 or 11. He's a great guy. Oh, dude, he is. Right. There's so many people that I've, I've gotten so extremely lucky to chatting with that were literally and figuratively and physically pieces of my childhood. That's why I do this podcast, man. Right. I bring people a piece of their childhood every week, or at least I try to. Yes. And yes. Billy yes. West was one of them. Rob Paulson, you're talking like Ren and Stinky, yeah. Well, no, uh, actually, Doug, right. Doug, and Fry from Futurama were oh, like yes, the first course. voices I yeah. heard. Um, you know, from from Billy. That's right. Yeah. And uh, you know, Rob damn near did every damn character I've I've, I've ever loved. You know, you can literally just throw a dart <laughs> at a wall, and then he's he's done it. You yes. know, um, and such a kind person too, man. I couldn't I couldn't yeah. ask for a sweeter person when I first met him, but um. Yeah, Billy West was just such a really nice person, and he, I, I don't know if we talked about it on air or mm-hmm. off air because it was so long ago, but he had so many great stories about June Foray, and he wasn't the only one. I've heard so many you know stories off air about yeah. June Foray, but when you think of that name, what comes to right. mind when you think about June? Well, not only the, 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 uh, the, the fact that she was the female version of somebody like Paul Fries doing all those great voices in fraction mm-hmm. fairy tales that I recognized as a kid used to make me laugh that battle axe voice that she did like <laughs> Ma Kettle out of the old Ma and Pa Kettle films um, which was my favorite voice that she did you know uh, like an ugly fairy godmother or something um, but she was also as as I wrote to her a year after I wrote to Doris Butler um, again one of the nicest people so when I met her um, and she had already put Corey Burton and me as these uh, pen friends. Um, she picked me up at the Holiday Inn and took me to a Chuck Jones session. This, this is that same trip. That's uh, so cool. Yeah, yeah. It was one of those specials he was doing in the in the early 70s, like the Lorax or uh, Horton, Here's a Who, one of those sort of uh, Dr. Dr. Seuss. Seuss things. Yeah. And, uh, and then like she she just again was just so down to earth and then years later like after i'd started to be very successful doing my uh, career here i was on one of my trips there and um it was in 91 so jay ward had just died about 18 months before and on a whim i'd done a whole demo of the voices just on the off chance that they would ever revive the characters and I did this demo and I took it and to show you how long ago this was. It was on a cassette, you know, <laughs> so, and uh, and June Foray had taken Corey Burton and myself to dinner one night because we'd known her all these years. And she was just uh, by then still working really regularly back in the uh, early 90s, but getting a little older. And uh, and um, so I, I gave her this cassette and. Obviously, the voices on it must have impressed her, you know, the, the Bullwinkle and I did Dudley and Inspector Fenwick and all of these characters, the narrator. And uh, she played them when she went home. She, I found out the next day that uh, when she went home, uh, she played them over the phone, held the phone up to this old cassette deck that she had and played them to her agent, who was a guy called Don Pitts, who was Paul Fries's agent and all these people. And here's the here's the next one of these fate looking down on me things. I'm staying again at the Holiday Inn on Highland and Hollywood. And I get a phone call from this guy, Don Pitts, who had this funny high-pitched little voice. Hey, uh, hey Keith, uh, June Frey gave me this, uh, played this tape for me last night. I'd like to, I'd like to represent you here in Hollywood. And I like, after I fainted and got up off the floor, then I find out He's right across the road from the hotel I'm staying in, in this Jesus. in this old building. This, this is weird. It's like <laughs> so. Thanks to June Foray, this is what I meant when I said that she really started my career doing voices in in the U.S. Because uh, in those days he would he would recommend me for jobs, and uh, we'd do them by this new technology ISDN, which is similar to Zoom, I guess, but it was like a professional sound. You did sound like broadcast quality in the same room 14,000 miles away, but uh, ended up, you know, that Jay Ward, Tiffany Ward, Jay's daughter, heard the same cassette that I did, thanks to June Foray, and she started appointing me the voice that she wanted for some of the characters. But I started out being appointed as Boris Badenov because they weren't happy with some of the people who were doing Boris, you know. And um, 
So again, I, uh, to circle back to your question, June Foray was pivotal to me, but also just again like Doris Butler, one of the most down to earth and nicest people that you'd ever you'd ever want to meet. Very very little pretense. She was she loved what she did. She was like Mel Blanc. Um, you know, uh, if she didn't have a gig, she'd ring her agent up and say, "Get me an effing job." You know, like like uh, <laughs> because. Uh, it was in her blood by then, you know, the old thing about you, you, you've got to keep doing it. Even if you, even if she had made enough money to never need to re, to work again, she still wanted to work, you know? Oh, that's, uh, that's so cool, yeah. man. Thank you for sharing those stories. Oh, um, no problem. When, when you're writing this book, do you remember what year you started writing and gathering all the, obviously you're gathering all the information from all the chats you're talking to with all these people, but when you sure, really yeah. set out to say, I want to write this book, do you remember what year that was? Be yeah, it was almost exactly 10 years before it was published. In 1990, I, I sent a letter to Jay Ward's wife, Billy, uh, or her real name was Ramona, um, saying that uh, you may not know me, but uh, I, I mentioned all of Jay's voice people who knew me and told her a little bit about what I do and said, if ever you are considering a book and because it had been about a year since her husband had died and, and so mm -hmm. she was over the worst aspect of that i said uh, i would i would dearly love to uh, and then i found i found out that the, some guy who worked at the museum of tv and radio in new york city had already um sent them a request to be an author about that book about the history and she said well we do have somebody but how about you send me a sample of your writing so i i hadn't even written anything but i it was all in my head and, and all, all my notes on, on all the multiple you know visits. And so I wrote a chapter about the fractured fairy tales and sent it to them, you know, by snail mail. <laughs> and, uh, and she um, wrote back uh, saying, uh, we're very pleased with your writing style and we'd like to put you in, in, in the running. And this was like November of 90. And in March of 1991, I get a letter from her daughter, Tiffany, on the day I'm traveling to the US on one of my many trips there, this is sheer coincidence, this letter from Tiffany Ward saying, um, we uh, at J Ward Productions are ready to go forward with the book and we have approved you as our author of choice. So there you oh, go, so that's, cool. that's what it was. So in that was enough for me to begin on that trip. When I got there, I thought, well, I, I took the letter with me just you know, to, sh to show you know that fear you wrote this don't forget <laughs> <laughs> and anyway she gave me uh the the address of howard brandy who was jay ward's old friend who was a publicity guy who used to work mm -hmm. for them and accompanied him on that mad trip that he did to washington in 1962 where he got caught in the cuban missile crisis and um Mussolvania, you know um and uh, he had his old Rolodex. He gave me the, the phone numbers of all the people who I interviewed for the book, Bill Hertz, the director, you know, and all these people that you'll see in, in the, my interviews. Um, and so the, the, the job really began while I was there on that trip. And when I got home, I started doing again, shows you how technology's changed. Back, back in 91, I started doing international phone calls to do interviews. So now you, you could do zoom or whatever. Um, with all these people and i fortunately I, I was i had an ability to take very accurate quick notes of, of mm -hmm. what they were saying so everything in that book i stand by is very accurate i've i've uh, i i I've tried to be self-critical but i haven't noticed too many things that i was um, oh my god why did i put that there was not that moment you know uh, and of course most of them approved it because I, I i was started to send chapters as it was being written um uh, and and even jay ward's widow was she'd give me tiny little things like she she colored in that story of when he was hit by the truck and that's why mm -hmm. um a couple of people said gee that chapter reads like you really were there you know it's because of the families uh, ha have accepted me now so i've got that credibility and they're telling me things that they probably hadn't discussed with people before so uh that's that's where it really became uh this sudden realization of gee you know i better take this really seriously because they're treating me like a historian you know that's uh, really that, cool that's yeah yeah it, it was really fascinating the way it all sort of unfurled you know